This is the Overlord of the Wasteland, the engineer of combat, the big boss with the hot sauce, Ricky Regal. This is Samantha Starr, the perfect knockout. What's up, everyone? It's the meatball himself, Tommy Capone. You're listening to the CIW Report right here on Spreaker.com. The views and opinions heard on the CIW Report does not reflect the views and the opinions of the members of the show. It's time for the Carolina Independent Wrestling Report. Heard each Monday right here on Spreaker.com from 7 until 8 p.m. With all the happenings that's going on inside the world of Carolina Independent Wrestling. And now, the Carolina Independent Wrestling Report. Thank you for joining us for the return of the CIW Report. During our time away, both John Schuyler and Ethan Case appeared at the WWE. Congratulations to you both. We look forward to seeing and hearing more from you in the near future. And on a somber note, we have to send out our condolences to Brock Phoenix and his family on the loss of his daughter, Tony Jean Hicks. Please join us for this moment of silence as we pause to honor one of the CIW's own. Our interview with Chris Hamrick will start right after this. We'll be right back with our featured interview on this week's Carolina Independent Wrestling Report right after this. PWX Wrestling returns to Winston-Salem, North Carolina at Siggy, February 22nd, 2015 with Cedric Alexander, Caleb Conn, Country Jack, Worst Case Scenario, John Schuyler, Anthony Henry, and for the first time in North Carolina, The Young Fox. Tickets available at pwxpro.com. It's PWX Wrestling. Live the experience. Be listening later in the show for the PWX Word of the Week. Then locate their ticket page on their website at pwxpro.com and enter the code word for your chance to win a free ticket. Two tickets per week. Here's what you don't get if you miss the Ninja Troll Digicast on Spreaker.com. Let's talk about our two, Tim Dixon. Let's. And, and you know what? I think I'm going to do the chivalrous thing, and whether she likes it or not, yes. we're going to let Tim go first. Oh. <laughs> So that way we get eight before beauty, right? It's the Ninja Troll Digicast, Friday nights at 8 p.m. on Spreaker.com. With previous shows available on demand, it's the only podcast with a kick. It's the Ninja Troll Digicast. This is the Southern Savior, John Schuyler. This is Ethan Case. This is Samantha Starr, the perfect knockout, and you are listening to the CIW Report. I am joined this evening by high-flying ECW original Chris Hammer. Chris, thank you for coming on the show. No problem. Second time I've done it, he's a little punk ass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hammer, hey, listen, I got I gotta say that I'm sorry. I'm gonna publicly apologize to you right here. Because there was a malfunction on my computer. I'm sure that it was operator error, but something happened and we lost it. So here we go again. I'm not gonna start out with your training or anything like that. I wanna know the first show that you worked. Uh, the first show I worked, I worked for my dad and Jay Eagle over in Mooresboro at the old school gym. And I wrestled Alvin Melton. And when I found out I was wrestling and that I was going to be a heel, I told everybody that would listen. I'd be like, because I grew up idolizing Ric Flair. And I'm like, I'm going to be just like Flair. I'm going to talk and talk and talk, and everybody's going to hate me. Then when it came time for the actual show, they had to push me out of the curtain. I went straight to the ring, didn't say nothing. Did my match, didn't say nothing, came back and didn't say nothing. <laughs> I was scared to death. <laughs> Times have changed since then, though. I've got I've come out of my shell a little bit. So what's going through your mind during that first match, man? Was it one of those things of I've got to think about what I'm doing or let's just get it over with? Uh, hey, I'm here. <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like it is today. Yeah, but it's different. I'm not scared today. I just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, outside of Ric Flair, who was your other influences in professional wrestling? Well, when I first started wrestling, Flair was it. Flair was the only one I watched. I used to buy the wrestling magazines. I'd yeah. cut the pictures of Flair out and throw the rest of them away. <laughs> I, I fucking love Flair. 
And I would go to a show, and even though it's a work, you still get caught up in it. You know what I'm saying? Especially at a young age. I, I would sit in my seat and wouldn't say nothing until Flair came out, and then I was nonstop. So it was either Flair or nothing? Flair or nobody. Wow. And then as I grew up in the sport, it was Ricky Morton. I, I love Buddy Landale when he came out, New Nature Boy. And then later on, it was Shawn Michaels. What was it about these guys that made you like what they were doing? Flair just stood out. I was a Flair fan before he ever even became the U.S. champion the first time. Hell, I think I probably cried when he was in the plane wreck. And then Ricky Morton just, you could tell, you could just look at Ricky and tell he was cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then Shawn Michaels, he was just, he was God in wrestling boots. There was nothing that man couldn't do and, you know, do it well. So what about Buddy Landale? Buddy was, he was cool too. He was like, it was funny because like, I would tell everybody that I like Buddy. And then I remember going to Greenville, watching Flair and Buddy Landale wrestle each other. And the whole time I'm telling people, I'm like, I'm cheering for Buddy. I'm cheering for Buddy. But when Flair hit the ring, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> Were you a fan of Ricky Morton during the time that the Four Horsemen was running wild on him? The time that they broke his nose? Uh, no, I actually cheered when they did that. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I hated rock and roll when they first came in. I guess because they was all goody goody baby face and. Shit. Mm-hmm. But then the more that I watched Ricky, I was like, you know, he he just seems cool. And then when I met him, I was like, Psh, that guy's awesome. Moving ahead into your career. Who did you have your first feud with? Oh, my God. I don't know if I've ever had a feud. <laughs> this is independent wrestling. <laughs> um, I mean, you walk in the door, you don't know if you're babyface or heel, you know? You, I didn't have a feud with nobody. You went to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, correct? Yes. Were you there during the New Jack Rock and Roll Express days? <laughs> I wrestled New Jack his very first match in Smoky Mountain. Me and Anthony Michaels were at him and Mustafa. And I put Jack over like a million bucks. And that's why Jack has so much respect for me to this day. He's never forgotten that. You know, people will say, well, New Jack don't respect this, he don't respect that. He's always respected. I made him look, you know, so good on TV, his very first TV show. And he's never forgot it. Thank God. So did his reputation precede him into that? What do you mean? Uh, was he was he the badass that he is that we see there on YouTube and all that? Did that precede him as he was coming in? I mean, he still did the same kind of promos, and shit, but he was wrestling. He wasn't a hardcore stuff. It was wrestling. You know, when he got in the match with the Rock and Roll Express or Tracy Smothers and somebody, he wrestled. That's what they did down there. They wrestled. It wasn't a hardcore ECW style. You know, so people would say that New Jack can't work. It's full of shit because he can work. What other friendships did you get out of that time that you were there? Oh, Chris Jericho, Chris Candido, Brian Lee, Tracy Smothers, pretty much everybody. Like, when I first went, you know, I had just came off WWE TV doing the uh, enhancement gimmick. And um, I wrestled Brian Lee and Candido. They called a match, and pretty much Brian just beat my ass for like 10 minutes. And after the match, he goes, hey, you wasn't that guy that flew through the ropes on Raw the other night, was you? know what? Yeah, that was me. He goes, you should have told me. I would have spotted the shit out of you. He goes, man, you can work. I went, well, you know, I'm not going to go and smoke him out. and going, hey, see me on Raw the other night? That was me. You know, you just don't do that shit. But me and Brian became real good friends. And then guys did, too, once they learned it. I could do what I did. It, you know, it was a lot easier. Um, I remember working um, 30 white boy, Tony Anthony, one night. He goes, can you take a choke slam? I went, I'll try. And, you know, after the match, he's like, I had to pull you out of the air. I went, yeah, that's what I do. And I honestly think, and, and I ain't going to swear to it, but I think if I would have stayed, Cornette would actually kind of try to do a little something with me eventually. He loved me. He told me I was on every show, every TV show, you know. And then um, 
one week he called me and I didn't call him back or whatever, but I went ahead and went to the show anyway. He gets out of his car and he's like, oh, damn, Chris Hammock, I didn't know you was going to be here. Somebody ain't working tonight. I think eventually he might have, but at the time I was more interested in girls and like that. So, I mean, I wouldn't even return Cornette's calls when he called. And it was fun, but it wasn't, I didn't have to have it. You know what I'm saying? Describe to me what dealing with Jim Cornette, the businessman, is like. You know me. You know how I am. I f*** with people. <laughs> so how it all started is I did a match with the 123 Kid on WWE, and I did the bump through the ropes, and Cornette come back and talked to me after my match. He goes, where are you from? And I told him, he goes, well, that's not far from where I run. He goes, would you be interested in coming doing that bump for me on my TV? And I went, here's a card, call me. And, you know, sure enough, like three or four days later, he called me, and he's talking to me. Of course, he's filling my head full of shit. He's like, you know, the people in New York saw the bump, but I saw so much more and blah, 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 blah. And so then, you know, I went from getting beat from one time a night to getting beat four times a night. So how much did that one spot change your life? It didn't. I didn't take it serious at the time. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I wrestled, I wrestled. If I didn't, I didn't. I, I didn't really. I wasn't dying to be a wrestler. It was fun when it happened, but if it didn't happen, I didn't care, and I didn't care enough to go after it. That, that's my biggest regret in wrestling is until ECW, I never wrestled out of the Mid Atlantic states. And, you know, I'd be on shows with the names, and they'd be like, man, you need to get out and blah, blah, blah. And, and to me, when I was growing up, I, I was stupid. I was like, well, if they want me, you know, they'll call me. But if they don't know you, they're not going to call you. So I would wrestle the local shows, and I honestly didn't even worry about getting my name out there. So at this point in your life, do you regret that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just wish that I would have done it sooner and try to make an impact. But like I said, wrestling wasn't my life then. You know, I like doing it, but I wanted to do it close to home. Hi, this is Tim Dixon. Hey, everybody, this is the Thoroughbred Kid Holiday. This is referee Ron Mills, and you're listening to the CIW Report. This is Bryce Anthony, one half of the Sons of Steel. Make sure you check out Boomer Payne and myself in the Sons of Steel saga every Friday on Spreaker.com. Carolina Independent Wrestling Report will be right back, right after this. Would it be crazy if you just stopped everything, packed your bags and left for a week, a month, a year? What if you left for two years? Would people think you'd lost your mind? What if you were going far away to help in a village on the edge of the Gobi Desert? A village crowded with Buddhist temples, not skyscrapers. A place where there isn't a word for recluse, but a thousand words for community. Would it be crazy to go 5,000 miles from home? To spend time with people the rest of the world only reads about? To build libraries and fill them with stories? Prepare a meal with food you helped grow? To teach children and learn a thing or two about yourself? Would that be crazy? Peace Corps. Life is calling. How far will you go? To find out more, call 1-800-424-8580 or visit PeaceCorps.gov. Now to more of our interview from this week's featured guest on the CIW Report. One of the names that come to mind when I think about the history of Chris Hamrick is Kid Cash. Uh -huh. What's one of the best memories that you have with your time that you've spent with him? Man, I love Dave Cash. Um, we hit it off from day one. I mean, like, before I even met him, you know, I'd read the Wrestling Observer, and it said Ricky Morton had a new partner and blah, blah, blah. So I want to say the night that I met him, Ricky no-showed a show, and, you know, I had the blonde hair and the tassels and all that bullshit. And the promoter goes, would you take Ricky's place? And I went, sure. So me and Cash teamed up, and, I mean, we just hit it off from day one. The best memory I have of Dave, well, I've got two, actually. We were doing a show, I don't know where, but I was living in Chesney, South Carolina at the time. And Dave and 
somebody was driving, and there was a girl in the car. They were following me, and we were going back to my girl's house. 